evening, everyone. I'd like to call the May 18th, 2022 meeting of the Dr. Cog Board of Directors to order. Does that work? That, that worked? Thank you. It's so nice to see people in three dimensions. I want to thank our staff for arranging the room you know, with a little more distancing among folks, should they so choose. There is a mask, a face mask at your seat, should you choose to use it. Uh, there's, is there hand sanitizer? There is. There. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> so, uh, I guess the first order of business for me here is to announce any new uh, alternates or members. We have one new alternate to announce who I do not believe is here, but from the town of Lyons is Greg Etting, O-E-T-T-I-N-G. I hope I pronounced that right. I'm, I'm half German, I should know that, Etting. And uh, we would ask that you please keep side conversations to a minimum uh, because these cameras, we call them owls, they look like little owls, they will pick up the, they will pick up the slightest bit of conversation and send it out to any of the member of the public that's watching us on Zoom. Uh, so please be aware of that. Uh, your microphone at, at your table works this way. The red, light, the red light on the left, the microphone with a slash through it, it means it's off. When you want to speak, touch that, and the red light on the right will light up, and that means your microphone is on. And you can see the little red ring around the mic. It's, hi, Julia. I worked with her at RTD. Uh, the, that light will come on. When you're finished with your remarks, please touch the mute microphone like I just did and you couldn't hear me. So uh, I think that's... Uh, are there any alternates here? We do have some alternates here. Do we have alternates here who are... Uh, that their directors are also here? Because if you are an alternate, you may be seated here at the table only if you're... Uh, sitting in for your for the director, and uh, it doesn't look like we have any situation like that. So that's good. All right. Uh, the next item of business is roll call. Melinda. Sorry, we were uh, limited on table mic, so I decided I'd give mine up. So, <laughs> can everyone hear me? Okay. Perfect. Okay. <clears throat> Oh, you know what? I've got a little trait. Or no, I don't. Okay. All right, let's get started. Uh, Steve Odoricio of Adams County. Uh, Commissioner Lynn Baca sitting in for Commissioner Odoricio. Lynn no. Baca, thank you so much. Uh, Jeff Baker of Arapahoe Here. County. Here. Claire Levy of Boulder County. Matt Jones sitting in for Claire Levy. Thank you, Matt Jones. Uh, William Lindstedt, City and County of Broomfield. Here. Uh, Randy Wheelock of Clear Creek County. Nicholas Williams for the City and County of Denver. George Teal of Douglas County. Yes, ma'am. Webb Sill of Gilpin County. Tracy Craft Tharp of Jefferson County. Yes. Lisa Smith, City of Arvada. Present. Allison Coombs, City of Aurora. Mike Kaufman, City of Aurora. David Spellman of Blackhawk. Nicole Spear of Boulder. Margo Ramson of Bomar. Here. Jan Plowski of Brighton. Here. Deborah Mulvey of Castle Pines. Here. Jason Gray of Castle Rock. Tim Dietz of Castle Rock. Tammy Maurer of Centennial. Uh, Mike, Mike Sutherland. Mike, yeah. Mike Sutherland here for Tammy Maurer. For Thank you so much. Cara Tanucci of Central City. Jeremy Fay of Central City. Randy Wheel of Cherry Hills Village. Happy to be here. Roy Palmer of Columbine Valley. Gail Christie of Columbine Valley. Craig Hurst of Commerce City. Thank you so much. Steve Conklin of Edgewater. Here, good evening. Othaniel Sierra of Inglewood. Here. Ari Harrison of Erie. Here. Linda Montoya of Federal Heights. Sonia Jensen of Federal Heights. 
Don Cognac of Firestone, David Whelan of Firestone, Josie Cockrell of Foxfield, Lisa there. Jones. Oh, I'm sorry, is that Josie? Yes. There we go, thank you. All right, Lynette Kelsey of Georgetown. Here. Rachel Binkley of Glendale. Present. Paul Hazeman of Goldman. Golden. Don Cameron of Golden. Present. George Lands of Greenwood Village. Dave Kerber of Greenwood Village. Chuck Harmon of Idaho Springs. Here. Stephanie Walton of Lafayette. Hello. Jeslyn Sherezai of Lakewood. Here. Stephen Barr of Littleton. Kyle Schlachter of Littleton. Jamie Jeffrey of Lock Bowie. David Ott of Lock Bowie. Wynne Shaw of Lone Tree. Here. Joan Peck of Longmont. Ashley Stoltzman of Louisville. Holly Rogan of Lyons. Colleen Whitlow of Mead. David Adams of Mead. Paul Sutton of Morrison. Christopher Larson of Nederland. John Dyack of Parker. Here. Sally Daigle of Sheridan. Neil Shaw of Superior. Here. Jessica Sandgren of Thornton. Julia Marvin of Thornton. Here. Sarah Nermella of Westminster. Bud Starker of Wheat Ridge. Rebecca White of CDOT. Sally Chafee of CDOT. Bill Van Meter of RTD. All right, and is there anyone that was not called or was not able to respond? All right, and with that, Mr. Chair, we do have a quorum. Thank you, Melinda. Uh, next item of business is um, we ask for a motion to approve tonight's agenda. Could I ask for a member to do so? Don't all rush. Uh, Director Williams moves. Second. Director Shaw seconds. All in favor of approving tonight's agenda, please say aye. 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 Opposed? <laughs> Thank you for that. And uh, any abstentions? No. Okay, so the agenda is approved. The next item, report of the chair. My report is very brief. First is to welcome all of you back to our room in person. We haven't been here in more than two years, and it's really wonderful to see everybody here. It really is. It's been a really rough time for a lot of us, and some of us more than others. And uh, it's just good to be able to shake people's hands again to welcome them and to see them in three dimensions rather than two. Um, the only other caution I give to that is with my eyesight, I'm going to try to read everybody's name tags. And some of you I haven't seen in so long, and so many of you are new. Uh, Melinda was kind enough to make, a, to make a cheat sheet for me. <laughs> so I will do my best. And if I get your names wrong, please forgive me. Uh, the other uh, report I would make is uh, I want to thank staff for their incredible work on the awards celebration. I hope most of you were there, but it was a fantastic event. It was really well accepted. Uh, I mean, what more can you say about the choice that we made to honor our frontline workers? As I said, these are the people who could not stay home during a pandemic. They could not stay home because they had to serve the people who could not leave home. And, and that was great work. A lot of us had the luxury of working from home and they did not. And I thought it struck really the right tone uh, for this year. And so we didn't give the John Christensen Award this year. We honored the people in the trenches. So thank you to staff for putting that together. I think it was very well done and well received. So with that, uh, let's move to the report of the Performance and Engagement Committee. Uh, Director Shaw. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, the Performance and Engagement Committee has not met since our last report, so I look forward to reporting next month. Thank you. Thank you. Report of Finance and uh, Budget Committee. Uh, Director Baker, there you are. I'm here. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, this evening, uh, 
545, the Finance and Budget Committee met. We had two action items. The first one was a resolution authorizing Director Rex to negotiate and execute a contract with Enterprise Leasing Company of Denver to provide van pool services for the Way to Go Van Pool Program. This is a going to be a contract not to exceed $947,000 per year, and that resolution was uh, passed unanimously. The other action item was discussion of a resolution authorizing Mr. Rex to accept additional ARPA funds of approximately $322,000 available through September 30th, 2024 to support public health workers and uh, those who are responding to COVID-19 pandemic. And again, that motion uh, passed unanimously. That concludes my report. Thank you, uh, Director Baker. Next up, report of the Executive Director, uh, Mr. Rex. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, very much. And I will echo the Chair's comments regards. It's so great to see everybody, my word. I, I'll be honest, um, we were expecting kind of a lower turnout tonight. Uh, uh, and that's why we set up the desk the way we did. We would have added an additional row if we thought we were going to get this many. So thank you all so very much. It's great seeing you. I'm glad we could sneak this, meet this meeting in before the five to eight inches we're supposed to get Friday night. Still trying to, I grew up in Canada and I can't get over that. So anywho, I hope it doesn't come to fruition because um, I'm done. I'm, it's golf season. Um, so thank you very much. And I also on the uh, award celebration, I would like to just mention that to you all real quick. And thank you if you're able to attend that. It made the event just so special for us. We had, it was our largest event we've ever had. We had over 500 attendees at the event. Right? And, um, and, but I will tell you if, I mean, we, I've gotten a lot of great emails and texts and calls from you all. So thank you very much about, uh, about the experience that you had at that event. But if you have thoughts on how we may improve it, please just reach out to me or, or Steve Erickson, our communications and marketing director, and uh, we'd be happy to, to, to um, um, you know, inventory all those comments so that we can make next year's even better. Um, and Chair Flynn also mentioned uh, some of the awards that were presented at that event, but I think the most special one, of course, was the one that he mentioned with regards to the, the, uh, the, the champions of, of older adults that we did. I, I thought that was awesome. And Chair Flynn, I thought you did a tremendous job that night, sir, so thank you very much. Appreciate you. Yes, indeed. Um, Bike to Work Day uh, is, uh, is up and running again. For We've been away for three years, so it's scheduled for Wednesday, June 22nd. And there's some posters and some um, uh, additional info on the credenza over here in case you'd like to take some of those. That would be great. Director Baker is uh, kind of showing the, the logo this year. And I will tell you that all our logos over the past several years, right, Steve Erickson, has been done in-house, right? I know this one was done in-house, so it's, it's a pretty cool logo, and I think it'd be, look pretty good on a T-shirt. So with that said, if you did order a T-shirt, they will be here in time for that June event. So if you have any questions about this event, um, please reach out to myself or Steve Erickson. It is the second largest event of its kind in the country. Um, and we're hoping to get the 25, 30, 35,000 that we typically get for for um, for the um, bike to work day event. And it's of course it's not about the event itself. It's about you know giving people a safe and fun environment to try biking to work with the hope that they will continue to to utilize that. You don't have to do it five days a week, but maybe there's a day a week that you can do that, right? So that's kind of the the whole concept associated with. I would like to just share just a couple just miscellaneous um, items that we have coming up. We have the opportunity to, to meet with various groups as they come through town, which I think is always pretty cool. And I just wanted to mention a couple that were uh, upcoming. Um, we're going to be participating in a uh, delegation from the European Union next Tuesday is coming uh, with a focus on climate action, resiliency, and innovation. Um, we'll be talking about our, re our efforts in respect to the greenhouse gas emission rule that you'll hear, you've heard a lot about and you'll hear a lot more in over the coming months. And, of course, just giving a, them a briefing of what Dr. Coggs does. Because regional councils, while it's, it's, you know, it, it's pretty common, obviously, in the U.S., it's not the case in other parts of the world, including Canada. I, mean, I had a call fairly recently with some folks in Alberta that were interested in forming a regional council. So, anyway... I digress. Um, June 3rd, we'll be hosting a, an Iraqi delegation of energy officials 
to discuss the Baghdad-Denver Partners Regional Partnership. And this is a partnership Dr. Cog's been involved in with several years. Now, we've been in hiatus a little bit during the pandemic, but we're looking to kick that back up again and uh, provide any um, um, you know, support that we can from an educational perspective to our, our partners in, uh, in Baghdad. Um, last but not least, just uh, we're also July 14th to see CU Denver and Dr. Cog are hosting 25 participants from in um, uh, Mandela, Washington, emerging emerging leaders in Africa. Um, so they're coming to town, and we're also looking at the possibility of uh, of, of doing more of that. We do it through World Denver a lot, of, and some of you all are probably involved in that too. So I just wanted to share that with you. I think some of this stuff is pretty cool that we get an opportunity to meet a lot of diverse folks around the world. Last but not least, um, I wanted to mention to you just some, uh, some staff news. Um, each year here at Dr. Cog, we select the Dr. Cog Employee of the Year. And uh, how we do that is that we ask uh, staff to nominate their colleagues. And this year we had 10 colleagues that were selected, or were nominated. And then what happens, the, the senior management team then votes on those nominees. And uh, the winner of the 2021 Employee of the Year is our very own Melinda Stevens. <laughs> well, <laughs> well, to to you new new members, if you hadn't had a chance to really really uh, yeah communicate and work with Melinda, you're gonna love her. She's fantastic, and I've, thank God we got her. I can tell you that. So congratulations, Melinda. Mr. Chairman, that's my report. Thank you, Doug. Uh, next on the agenda is up to 45 minutes of public comment. Uh, the board allocates that. Uh, each speaker is limited to three minutes. Uh, if there are additional requests from the public to address the board, time will be allocated at the end of the meeting to complete public comment. We ask that anybody who offers public comment uh, not speak on any issues for which a prior public hearing has been held already before the board. Uh, the uh, the Zoom meeting has members of the public on board. If you are in, I can't see the screen, but Melinda can. If you wish to offer a public comment, please raise your virtual hand. And I'm told that there is at least one at this point. Let me announce that you don't have a microphone. Okay. So our first speaker is my friend Randall Loeb. Uh, Randall, go ahead. You have three minutes. Good evening, everybody, and it's wonderful that you're back in action. I pray that you're all well um, and that you continue to be that way. Uh, my uh, interest is that 10 year anniversary that our glorious city of Denver just passed of the ban on camping, which had no impact other than to exacerbate an already difficult problem. I noticed that the state legislature just passed something that made it more uh, possible to um, take advantage of fentanyl um, people with uh, drugs and to put them, uh, in, give them like uh, some kind of de uh, a diminutive uh, treatment. And I think that actually makes a bit, as much sense as a camping ban. I was in the Denver um, right uh, paper um, this last uh, week with the prayer that I um, gave to them. And I've said this to you all before. We need to work together and pull together. Um, this is a very difficult time for our country, for democracy in general. We can see that by the way in which the legislature is conducting itself, the divisions that exist. And it doesn't make any sense if we want to solve these intractable issues of where it is that people will live. I am in Aloft, which is a non-congregate shelter. And fortunately, it's been extended to the end of the year, but that does not make any difference. We need to preserve housing options for all of our citizens, regardless of their circumstances. And I pray that we can talk to each other and share, as I do with the transit um, community and trying to come up with strategies to make it more possible for us to get around and share this wonderful front range. So I beg you, um, to work together more astutely and put your differences aside. Thank you for your time and energy in your devotion as public servants. Thank you. Thank you, Randall.
All right, next speaker up, we have Becky English. If you are mute, unmuted, you may get, uh, start your three minutes. Welcome, Becky. Thank you very much, and uh, good evening, members of the board of directors of uh, Dr. Cog. Uh, I'm Becky English, chair of the Sierra Club Transportation Committee in Colorado. Um, I wanted to um, take this opportunity this evening to uh, make a, a to applaud you for making what I hope will be a, 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 a decision that we will appreciate. Uh, an important decision to put Colorado further along the path to sustainable transportation. The Sierra Club uh, urges you to adopt the policy uh, directive articulated tonight uh, that the state of Colorado and local governments must do certain things in order to achieve the greenhouse gas reductions required by recent Colorado legislation. This uh, $40 million in investments funds six really important projects. It's a great start to help Colorado reduce the number of cars on the road and to reduce pollution and climate change causing greenhouse gases, of course. At Sierra Club, we urge you to continue focusing on five things. Transit, complete streets, walkable communities, biking, and of course, safety, working toward uh, uh, the vision zero. We would like you to put on your running shoes to do your part to uh, allocate this $4 billion in transportation funding to, um, to be decided on this coming year uh, are also allocated a lot more dollars and uh, in the five areas that I just mentioned, I'm hoping. Your decision-making will uh, need to include um, Dr. Cog's second tip call for projects uh, that launched on May 2nd um, with applications due very soon, I think at the end of June, with uh, a final decision um, in, in September that we hope will be very similar to uh, our hope for decision this evening. And uh, also you're gonna, be you're gonna be deciding about CDOT's adoption of their revised 10-year plan, uh, which includes a more detailed breakdown for the next four years of investments. So this process is happening now and adoption is uh, anticipated, of course, in September. Um, I just wanna thank you, Dr. Cog members, for, um, for putting these six projects uh, up as a model. I'm hoping there'll be a model for future expenditures uh, that are really about sustainable transportation and quite unlike many of the decisions that have been made in the past. Um, Sierra Club and our 100,000 members and supporters in Colorado very much appreciate uh, your more um, sustainable decision making. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ms. Ms. English. Uh, next speaker. And our next speaker is Rachel Hultin. Rachel, are you there? Your three minutes starts when you begin speaking. I am. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. Go ahead. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much. Uh, good evening, everyone. It's uh, good to see most of you all in the room again together. And it was really fun to see a lot of you at the event, um, the wonderful Dr. Cog event. My name is Rachel Hultine. I'm the Director of Sustainable Transportation for Bicycle Colorado. And uh, I'm here tonight uh, really on two topics. First of all, I had the great pleasure of serving on um, the committee that reviewed the call one tip applications. And it was uh, incredibly difficult to sort through over $100 million worth of funding requests, every one of them looking to advance the priorities that we care the most about, which include transit, walking, biking, safe streets, main streets, safety, and efficient land use. Um, I think the end product that is before you tonight is a wonderful balance of investments geographically across the region, as well as investments in all the different types of sustainable transportation options that will improve transportation in our region, as well as reducing greenhouse gas emissions. So I am encouraging the board to adopt the tip, uh, the first call tip projects that are presented to you tonight. The second thing I'd like to talk about um, as everyone in, in this room and in any, any room that has two or more transportation people in it these days, 
uh, transportation dollars are increasingly measured not in the, the road miles accomplished or the increased number of vehicles, but rather the impact on greenhouse gas emissions. Um, the, the current TIP application, the way it's formatted, captures to some extent greenhouse gas emissions. Specifically, it allows calculations for the reduction in greenhouse gas emissions for active transportation, walking and biking investments. There's also um, a section that calls for uh, sort of more specific types of emission calculations for the projects that are submitted. However, those calculations are actually bundled within the overall MetroVision uh, priorities and weighted um, collectively as a bundle across other considerations, including freight. Um, we would really like to see Dr. Cog revise the TIP application for calls number three and number four to have greenhouse gas emission impact as a standalone scoring item so that that one impact can be measured across the different projects that are being considered. Because every dollar spent moving forward is going to be a dollar that either uh, increases or decreases greenhouse gas emissions. And for the efficiency of our transportation dollars spent, as well as the goals and the necessary climate impact we need as a state and a region, every one of those dollars should be spent to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, as well as reducing BMT. So we would like to see, again, Dr. Cog revise the TIP application to have greenhouse gas impact as a standalone scoring so that the projects uh, can be viewed and scored on that measure as a standalone. Um, and then we'd also Rachel, like- Rachel, Rachel, the yep. three minutes has, has passed. Oh, okay. Well, thank yep, you for thank your you. time tonight. And I just wanna Certainly. say everybody ride your bike on Bike to Work Day. Thank you. Our next speaker is Eve Lempriere. Please correct me if I mispronounced that. Your three minutes starts when you begin speaking. Eve? Okay, can you hear me? Yes, we can, go ahead. Hi, my name is Eve Lampriere and you pronounced it very well. Uh, I live in Niwai. Um, I am here to share where I believe the Highway 119 bike path proposal is an important safety addition to our area. Um, to start with, I want to give you a little background and why I'm passionate about bicycle safety. Uh, a close friend of mine, Chuck Crenshaw, went out on what was supposed to be a quick lunchtime exercise ride on May 8th in 2017. He never came back. He was riding on the shoulder of Nelson Road when he was hit and killed. And it happened one week after another cyclist was killed riding down Sunshine Canyon. Last year, there were at least four fatal car bicycle accidents in the Boulder Longmont area. Not only does the cyclist suffer in a bicycle car accident, drivers suffer serious trauma. They can get tied up in the legal system, lose their license, or even go to jail. Roads can be temporarily closed and traffic can back up. Safety is crucial. On the brighter side, uh, last year I was fortunate to spend almost two weeks last summer cycling in the Netherlands and I got to see where cycling has been made safe. While people are aware that the Netherlands is a cycling haven now, it wasn't always that way. In the 1970s, protests occurred after over 500 children were killed in bicycle car collisions during the previous years. The result of the protests plus other factors got the country to prioritize bicycle safety. The Dutch have a design manual for bicycle traffic, which includes five uh, critical things to cycling infrastructure. They are number one, coherence, good connectivity between oranges and destinations. Number two, directness, minimum detours and delays. Number three, safety, minimal conflicts between cars and, and cyc uh, cyclists, comfort and attractiveness. When these five points are applied to the Highway 119 project proposal, all five points are met. In addition, Dutch road engineers classified roads by the speed of the cars traveling on them. Through roads with traffic of 100 kilometers per hour or roughly 62 miles per hour, must have a completely separate bike path and cyclists are not allowed on these roads. Highway 119 between Boulder and Longmont 
has speed limits from 55 to 65 miles per hour. It isn't unusual to see someone going faster. These speeds alone should be enough to defend the need for a separated bike path. Both Longmont and Boulder pride themselves on being bicycle friendly cities. Both have wonderful paths inside their cities. Residents of these two locations and the places in between uh, use this corridor regularly. For cyclists, there is no safe, paved, and direct route today. By building the Highway 1919 bike path, we are getting cars off the road, developing safer commuting for everyone, and encouraging alternative methods of transportation. Thank you. Thank you, Eve. Your three minutes has expired. We, re we really appreciate your comments very much. Thank you. Our next speaker is Matt Fromer. Matt, your three minutes begin when, uh, when you begin speaking. All right. Good evening, Dr. Cog board members. My name is Matt Fromer. I'm a Denver resident, and I work on clean transportation policy with the Southwest Energy Efficiency Project, or SWEEP. I'm here tonight to urge you to approve a $40 million investment in critical transit, bicycle, and pedestrian projects in the 2022-2025 TIP. These investments in bus rapid transit, bicycle and pedestrian connections, and the Lone Tree Mobility Hub represent the types of projects that will help us meet our Metro Vision goals to clean our air, improve safety for all users, and lower transportation costs, especially at a time when gas prices have never been higher. Specifically, I want to call out the Lone Tree Mobility Hub, which is part of a larger mixed-use transit-oriented development project. When complete, the three RT light rail stations will have roughly 10,000 new multifamily residential units, 35,000 new jobs, and millions of square feet of commercial and retail space, all within one mile of each other. We could use a few dozen more of these walkable transit-oriented communities in Denver with land use patterns that are shown to cut daily VMT in half. Tomorrow morning, the CDOT Commission will vote on the Greenhouse Gas Policy Directive, the implementation document for the state's greenhouse gas planning rule. It's been quite a journey to get here, and I applaud Dr. Cog's work to improve and implement the climate rule. It's worth repeating that complying with the greenhouse gas rule is not just good for the climate, and VMT reduction does not have to be painful. In fact, the rule is estimated to save Coloradans over $40 billion by 2050 in avoided vehicle operating costs and healthcare costs as we give people healthier and safer, cleaner and, and cleaner alternatives to driving. At this point, we should be asking ourselves how far this first round of TIP projects will get us toward the 2025 and 2030 GHG reduction targets. Now that the policy directive is in place, the next three rounds of project selection should be informed by how close Dr. Cog is to meeting the targets. This proactive approach will help us to identify the most climate-friendly projects while encouraging planners to incorporate more greenhouse gas mitigation strategies into the project applications. Things like parking management, compact, mis compact mixed-use development, and TDM. So I agree with Rachel's comments about including more accurate GHG scoring in TIP calls three and four. Lastly, it's exciting to see the Colfax BRT project move forward but it's taking far too long to complete. We cannot wait another century to build the other 10 regional BRT projects one by one. This BRT package in the Metro Vision is expected to reduce 140 million VMT per year, the equivalent of taking 12,000 cars off the road. So I ask this board, what do we need to do to, to advance all 10 bus rapid transit projects in the next few years? Thank you for the opportunity to comment. Thank you, Matt, very much appreciated. We have no one else in the queue for public comment, so I want to thank the folks who are watching out there in, uh, in the ether uh, as we meet here in person. Uh, next item on our agenda, item seven, is uh, move to approve the consent agenda tonight, which consists of the meeting summary of last month's meeting. I would, I, I would hope that folks have had a chance to review it, if they have any uh, questions about it or corrections, please offer them. Otherwise, I'll request a motion to approve the consent agenda. So moved. Who said that? Uh, Director Teal. Sorry, the voice is like Zoom. It seemed to come out of nowhere. Uh, second. Uh, second. Uh, Director Conklin. Uh, any discussion? I assume not. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed, say no. Any abstain, say abstain. Seeing none, consent agenda is approved. Thank you. Uh, item eight, discussion of the Dr. Cog draft 22-23 budget. 
Jenny Doc is going to present our budget to us. Welcome, Ms. Doc. There, is this on? Now, can you hear me? Oh, look at that. <laughs> now, thanks for having me, Chair. Um, it's good to see some familiar faces in person, <laughs> not on Zoom. So, thank you very much. Um, so, yeah, um, I, for those of you who don't know, we recently transitioned to a new fiscal year. Historically, Dr. Cog has operated on a calendar fiscal year. And in 2021, we transitioned over to the state fiscal year to be more in line with a lot of our, our state programs which is um, you know, a, a huge part of our funding. So, um, and also I thought to get started, I would kind of walk you through the process that we take in creating the budget. So basically our budget process would have started back in February. And at that time, the division directors convene and work together to come up with um, the budget surrounding their programs and the initiatives that they wanna accomplish in the next fiscal year. Then those budgets are brought to myself and also to Roberta Cole, who is my contracts and budget manager, and Doug. Um, we review the budgets, we make you know, modifications, go back, ask questions. And then in April, we presented a draft budget to the Finance and Budget Committee. And that gives them an opportunity to review the budget, ask questions, um, and if any you know, clarification is needed or modifications are requested, we make those at that time. We actually this year held a special meeting on May 3rd, and that is when FMB voted to recommend the draft budget to the Board of Directors, which brings us to tonight. So tonight we are asking you to approve the draft 22-23 fiscal year budget that's in your packet. So I'll just go over um, a few highlights. Um, overall, you, the agency year over year has experienced growth and it continues to grow, and so that's exciting for all of us. Um, Federal revenue, we're expecting to increase by about two and a half million dollars. This is in part due to uh, federal infrastructure investment and jobs act dollars that we're receiving. It also um, is comprised of some carryover COVID-19 funds. A lot of the COVID-19 funds that we received had longer terms. Um, traditionally, we get um, you know pots of money like that that have to be spent in 12 months. And uh, a lot of those dollars were 16, 24 month terms. So we still have quite a bit of money that we're carrying over. Um, and that equates to about um, 2.65 million. Our state revenue will increase by about 500,000. And that's largely due to uh, state funding for senior services. So a lot of those dollars will be used for our in-home voucher program, our transportation program in the AAA, and then also case management and transition services. Uh, local revenues are expected to increase by about $385,000, and that's largely due to our guaranteed ride home and van pool programs growing. Uh, throughout the pandemic, those programs you know, had declined participation, but now that people are returning to work, we're seeing an increase. As far as our in-kind uh, revenue there, um, we're expecting an increase of about 228,000, and that's a result of the growth in the Unified Planning Work Program and corresponding match requirements. So as that program, as we spend more money, we do have um, a responsibility to pay a certain amount of cash, cash match. So that's reflected there. So that is pretty much, oh, we'll also touch on member dues here. Uh, member dues, um, are up uh, by about $245,000. And I'll just explain that um, so that everyone is informed of what that's comprised of. So member dues are actually really important to the organization. Member dues help us pay for cash match on a number of different programs that require that. Without member dues, we could not receive those grants because we would not be able to pay the cash match that's required. It also pays for legislative activities um, for those of you who don't know, grant dollars cannot be used to lobby. So um, that pays for Rich Morrow. It pays for our contractors, our federal and state lobbyists that help us out. So those dollars are really important. I'll also note that we have not um, recalculated dues since 2020. Um, when the pandemic hit, we decided that so many of our member jurisdictions 
were um, having economic hardships that we would not recalculate due. So we haven't uh, for the past two budget cycles. So this is the first time that we've done it in a couple of years. For those of you who don't know, member dues are, they do have a formula that's set forth in our articles, and they are calculated off of assessed valuation and population for your jurisdictions. And that um, information comes from the Department of Local Affairs' most recent report. Uh, let's see here. So, So that's our revenue. So we'll move down here to um, our expenditures. So the personnel line item. So there's a couple of different factors that are baked into this number. First of all, I'll mention that we have budgeted for a 2% cost of living adjustment or market increase, um, however you like to term it. But that is in part due to inflation to try to offset you know, some of the, um, the, the rise in costs that you know, we're all experiencing. So that is in that number. Also, we've included a 3% merit pool, and that is based off of employee performance. Uh, we are expecting to hire staff this coming year. Um, we have about nine new positions in the Regional Planning and Development Division and Transportation Planning Operations. Um, a, a, most of that is due to the growth in UPWP and that additional funding of the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, SB 21, 260, uh, and, and the new regs um, around state greenhouse emissions. So we have several positions that we're hiring to help um, you know, meet all of those needs of, of those initiatives. And we also have about three administrative positions that we budgeted for. And as the organization grows, you have to have the support on the administrative side as well, right? So we have a position in communications and marketing. We have one in human resources, and one in administration and finance. And uh, these are all very welcome positions, <laughs> speaking for myself since one of them is in my division. <laughs> um, you may notice here, too, that we have some money in capital outlay this year, um, about $70,000. The Area Agency on Aging has grown so much that we have more personnel than desks at this point. So we are working with um, consultants and the building to see about reconfiguring the area on agency space. And so we've budgeted for about $70,000 to, um, to make some changes there if needed to have, you know, desk sharing um, and that sort, of, that sort of model. And we're still looking into that. Uh, let's see here. So our fund balance, let's see here. So, um, you know, we're budgeting for our fund balance to pretty much be flat, uh, around $11 million. And so, you know, our, our auditors have year over year suggested that we have a fund balance that's equal to about three months of our expenditures to cover, you know, any unforeseen circumstances where grantors can't pay us or we lose a funding source. Um, so that would actually be around $12 million. Uh, but 11 million is still very healthy. We have a really solid financial position right now. And I'll also note that any overages that we have do go to that fund balance, and then that allows us, you know, to continue to, you know, have a stronger financial position. So overall, our budget growth um, from 21-22 um, is up about 12.4%. So again, you know, that just reflects the growth um, in the agency. You'll also notice down here, I'll just point this out too, and pass through funds. This is um, an area that's growing for us as we've become direct uh, recipients of federal transit administration dollars. That's new over the last year. And then also the hu human services transportation. We've had that for a couple of years. Um, we've decided to move that to the pass through category since a majority of that money is passed through now. It goes directly to, um, out to the contractors to perform the work. So this chart right here, this pie, pie chart, just kind of shows, you know, um, overall a breakdown of where the revenue is coming from. And uh, you'll see here that the Area Agency on Aging, you know, has a pretty big percentage there <laughs> at 30%. Um, also, the Unified Planning Work Program. You'll see up in here, too, that member dues um, looks like it's about 5.76%. 
But in reality, that's only off of the funding um, that is not passed through. So off of that 34 million, instead of when you add the pass through um, to the total budget, we're at around 58 million. So actually like the member dues is, is closer to 4% when you take that into consideration. Here's just another way to look at it. Finally, I'll just end with this. I think this is an interesting visual here. This is, um, this is a different breakdown of the budget, and this is by strategic initiative. Doesn't look like I'm gonna fit the whole thing on here. So, apologize for that. But what I find most interesting about um, this visual here is this is the Unified Planning Work Program, and here we have the Area Agency on Aging. Um, and I've been here for seven years, and over seven years now, the first year I did this budget, those numbers were completely flipped. <laughs> so the area agency on aging was more around that 30% range and, and UPWP was 50%. What's interesting about that though is that UPWP funding hasn't decreased. As a matter of fact, it's increased. However, it just goes to show how much the area agency on aging has grown. I mean, it's really grown by leaps and bounds, you know, over the last five, six, seven years. So... Um, and then, you know, some of our staple initiatives here, the Traffic Operations Program, Way to Go, um, our Regional Data Acquisition Projects, which is DRAP and, and LIDAR and, and, and those sorts of things. So, um, yeah, so that's the overall budget. I'm happy to take some questions. We also have the division directors here for the most part. Jayla is not with us tonight, but, um, you know, if there's specific program questions, they're also here to answer those. So happy to hear your questions. Uh, thank you. And do we have any questions on the 2022-23 budget? Uh, Director Cameron. I think I turned my mic on. Um, I'm a little worried that 2% COLA and 3% merit might not be enough for retention plus flexibility to if we want to retain and hire the staff we want. You know, that's, that's a good point, um, and it's something that Doug and I have talked a lot about. I will say for, for those that, who may not know, we did just go through a, a comp survey, and we actually uh, made quite a few adjustments to salaries back um, in April to, um, to bring people level that when the, the comp surveys came back, if we felt that someone's um, pay needed to be adjusted or their grade even, we made those adjustments. So because I think starting with a, almost like with a clean slate in April of feeling like with our comps that we were, we were in a competitive range that the 2% um, COLA and 3% and merit is, you know, we feel that that's, that's, that's a, a good place to land. Um, and that being said, you know, open for discussion if, if we feel like something else should be considered. Executive Director Rex. Thank you, Director Cameron, for your question. And, and it is a conversation that we've had. Um, and, and for the points that Jenny said, I think we feel somewhat comfortable right now. But, of course, we can't predict the future. So there, there, could, be, there could be a time when we come back with, uh, with, with additional requests. But thank you, sir. Appreciate your question. Other questions? Comments? Sorry. Director Shahrzai. Very well done. Thank you. Um, I just I have a really granular question, but I was interested in what comprises our in-kind contribution. That's such a high number. So could you share a little more about that? Sure. So a majority of that comes from our UPWP grant. Um, we have a 17.21% match on that grant. And so 80% of that can be in-kind services. And uh, pretty much all of that right now comes from RTD. Um, and so that the staff that they provide working on initiatives that, um, that we're not contributing to financially. So that's a large part. We also have some coming in from volunteers in the AAA. Um, we're able to book a, an in-kind um, contribution from them. We can book their time. There's a, an hourly rate that you can assign to that, that the, you know, um, for federal guidelines that we use. Um, their mileage, reimbursement, things like that. So we also get um, some dollars from there. But in-kind is mainly coming right now um, from RTD for the UPWP grant. 
Director Rex. Thank you, sir, very much. And just to add to that, that originally when I first came, I know our match, we, we did 50% cash, 50% in-kind. And we have been successful over the last several years to, are we up 70% 70, 70 Ron? 75. At 75% in-kind and 25% cash. And uh, in, in an effort to keep our, keep our dues as low as we can. For sure. And um, now, granted, it reduces our, you know, administrative grant monies that we receive in the federal side because you can't pay people with in kind. So, uh, but but we're, we we have been able to offset that. So so it's been a it, it's worked out really well. Thank you, RTD, for the in kind. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Other questions, comments on the budget? Seeing none. I would like to entertain a motion from any member to um, the proposed motion is to approve the fiscal year budget. Feel free to uh, don't all rush. <laughs> Director Baker. Mr. Chair, I would uh, move to approve the fiscal year 2022 slash 2023 budget. Thank you for rescuing me. Uh, I see Director Harmon uh, seconding. Uh, any discussion on the motion? Thank you. Thank you very much, Jenny. Thank you. I appreciate you. your time. Uh, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed, please say no. Any abstaining, please say abstain. Hearing none, the motion passes unanimously. Thank you very much, Jenny and team. Mr. Chairman. Yes, sir. Can I just, can I just mention something real quick? I just want to thank Jenny and her staff for all the tremendous work that they do over there in, in Avenue yeah. Finance. I will tell you that, like like a lot of folks, we've been short-staffed in uh, in in the admin and finance division over the past several months. And uh, Jenny spent a lot of late nights in uh, doing doing work that others used to do. And I thank you so much, Jenny, for your work. Appreciate you. Thank you, uh, Director Rex. Next item up is discussion of the fiscal year 22-27 TIP Air Quality Multimodal Regional Share Funding recommendations. Uh, Ron, you're going to do it. Todd is still out? Okay. Uh, Ron Papstorf is going to present this, and uh, this is the part of the meeting I'm looking forward to. Thank you. Chair, directors, I'm Ron Papstorf. I'm the Transportation Operations Division Director here at Dr. Cog. I think so. Can you hear me okay? All right, thank you. I got a That's a hard training my neck and talking close into the microphone. Okay, uh, you've heard some comments about that during the public comment period. We're very grateful for the support that we've, that we've received and heard. Um, I think the public engagement part of this process is a, is a success story for us this cycle. Um, I do bring forward to you this evening for your consideration a proposal to fund six projects, uh, allocate uh, federal and state funding to those six projects, uh, totaling a little over $40 million. This is call number one of four calls for projects that we intend to complete over the next several months. Okay, there we go. Uh, we expect to allocate a little over $460 million to projects over the course of these four calls for projects. Uh, if you'll recall, back when you all adopted the policy for developing the Transportation Improvement Program, you set out this phasing of, of four separate calls for projects, and it was very intentional. Um, and as you heard a little bit in the public comment, we are also, while we're doing this, reviewing and evaluating our current 2050 Regional Transportation Plan against the new state greenhouse gas emission reduction rule. Um, and as part of that, what we wanted to do is start getting these dollars out the door as quickly as we can so that good quality projects can get started and can move forward while we're doing the regional transportation plan review. So these first two calls for projects are focusing on just those projects that improve air quality um, and using very specific funding sources from the federal government and the state. And the state. So the state multimodal options fund money from Senate Bill 260 a significant share of this, but also federal congestion mitigation air quality funds, a new carbon reduction program funding category in the federal infrastructure bill that was approved last, late last year, and transportation alternatives funding. 
So those funding sources that really fund similar types of projects, transit improvement projects, multimodal bike ped sorts of projects, uh, air quality improvement projects, we really want to focus those, get those dollars out the door to really good deserving projects so y'all can start implementing those good projects. Um, we've timed then call three and four, which adds in surface transportation block grant funds, which are our most flexible federal funds that we allocate through the TIP process that, are, that can be used for a much broader array of project types until after we've completed our greenhouse gas review of the regional transportation plan. So we know what the lay of the land is going to be as part of that review. And we know how much flexibility we'll have to, to utilize those funds. So this, this process, while somewhat cumbersome, complex, lengthy, uh, is very intentionally designed uh, for us to sort of balance a lot of different objectives. So we really appreciate your support for that policy. And, and um, we are anxious to get this first step done. And then, um, as you heard before, we have now kicked off the call two, which is focusing on the sub-regional share. So those projects that are evaluated and recommended through the sub-regional forums, the, the eight county areas in the Metropolitan Planning Organization area, so that you bring those recommendations forward for that next uh, set, of, set of projects. But again, same criteria, same types of project eligibilities. So uh, this, getting into some of the details around this call one, um, this opened uh, late January. Applications were due March 18th. Um, again, eligibility was limited to just air quality and multimodal types of projects that are eligible for those funds that we're allocating. Um, each sub-regional forum was allowed to um, submit up to three applications from the forum. So the local project sponsors brought those project ideas to the forum that they reside within. And then the forum decided on up to three projects that the forum could submit for consideration. Um, in addition to the sub-regional forum or the applications from the forum, um, there were two applications allowed to come from CDOT and RTD. Um, again, we had about a little over $40 million, $40.3 million to allocate in this process. We received 13 applications from throughout the region, um, uh, 11 of them through the sub-regional forums and two from the Regional Transportation District, RTD. Um, not every sub-region decided to submit applications. And I think there were, there were a variety of reasons for that. Every forum had that opportunity. Every forum had good discussions and deliberations about whether there were locally sponsored projects to bring forward through that process. I think some of, the, some of these funds have some pretty strict time frames associated with them for how quickly they can be spent. Uh, there are match considerations that local sponsors have to take into account when they're deciding whether to pursue these grant funds. Uh, so I think there were a couple of sub-reasons that just felt like they kind of had their hands full right now, didn't, weren't quite ready to submit. But again, we'll move into the sub-regional um, allocation process here now uh, through the end of June. Um, and wrap up that process in September and then move into the next two phases. Um, we um, at Dr. Cog's staff received those um, applications. We reviewed those against the technical criteria that you all approved in the, in the TIP policy um, and scored those projects from a technical standpoint. And then um, we also released that set of applications out for public review. We used, uh, we used an online comment form uh, that our team members um, in TPO and principally in the Regional Planning and Development Division created uh, to actually ease that process for public comment. So it was an interactive map. People could go in, they could see information about the applications, the projects that were submitted, and they could submit um, specific uh, comments uh, to, the, to that web map. Uh, we received 246 um, comments, really a great turnout. And I wanna highlight one of the changes that we implemented in this tip cycle uh, from PV previous uh, tip cycles. In the past, once we've done the review, once we've formulated a recommendation, a recommended set of projects, and we're ready to bring that set of projects forward as a recommendation for consideration, then we release that proposed package for public comment and get comments on that package. Um, as you might imagine, at some level, once there's a recommendation in front of a group, it can be somewhat baked. And we really question the validity of that public comment at that stage of the process. So in this case, we really uh, sped up that process. And again, I wanna give huge kudos to our staff because that was not easy and it was a very quick turnaround from all those applications. And it will be more challenging in the sub-regional uh, process when we have even more applications. Um, but what we, we thought it was really important to get that public comment 
while we were evaluating the projects and while we were so, so that it could inform the formulation of an actual proposal to bring forward to you all. Um, so um, again, really great turnout. We always want more. We're gonna keep continuing to try to improve that process, but I think this was a really positive step forward. Um, our next step was to convene a, a, a review panel to take into account our technical review and the technical stores, um, that look through the public comments that were received and try to come up with the best package of project uh, funding recommendations uh, possible for you to consider. So Rachel Holtine from Bicycle Colorado was one of our outside participants in that. Each sub-regional forum had a staff member that, that participated uh, with us on that panel as well as agency partners. So CDOT, RTD had members on that committee as well. Really important group. So this recommendation really came from that review panel, not from Dr. Cog's staff. The technical scores were a really important consideration, but at the end of the day, the review panel really was looking at the full package and trying to figure out how to put a package of funding allocations forward that would give the best uh, overall improvement for the region that they could. Uh, so the recommendation from that panel that has now gone through the Transportation Advisory Committee and the Regional Transportation Committee for your consideration tonight is to fund six projects totaling, again, $40.3 million. Um, the, the panel really was focused on making sure that there was a good, strong set of projects to allocate funds to um, from around the region, because we did. We had, we had some really great applications, uh, and really I think they were focused on trying to make sure that they could fund a large and diverse set of projects so that there was regional benefit um, and, and from, the, from this package. So I'm not gonna go into a lot of detail on each of those. You've had those in your packet. Uh, this does come with a, a unanimous recommendation from the Transportation Advisory Committee and a unanimous recommendation from the Regional Transportation Committee uh, yet, uh, yesterday morning. So with the motion in front of you for your consideration this evening is to allocate the $40,323,000 $40, of air quality and multimodal funds to six projects as presented to be included in the current 22 to 25 TIP. And then just so you know the next steps, as I mentioned, call two is now open. That closes towards the end of June, June 24th, I think is the, is the application deadline uh, for those applications to the sub-regional forums. Um, and then later in September, once that second set of uh, projects comes forward to the board for your consideration, then we'll amend this entire package from call one and call two into the current, current TIP, and then project sponsors can start their work to, to get going on those projects. With that, Mr. Chair, uh, be happy to take any questions. Thank you, Mr. Papsdorf. Uh, let's take questions, comments, input from directors. Oh, come on. <laughs> <laughs> Director Dyack. Thank you, Chair. Uh, no, I mean, taking a look at the, um, the, the projects that, uh, that were submitted, uh, it looks like, um, I think, Ron, you probably had a, a better a uh, better term than spread the peanut butter, but um, um, you know I think uh, I think all all counties or subregions benefited. Um, I, I'm very supportive of that. I think we all have we all have challenges in our own counties and subregions that we need to work on, no, no matter how big or how small. So, to me, I think that's uh, that's very important and supportive of the overall package. Thank you. Thank you, Director. Teal. Thank you, Chair. Well, I'd like to um, add uh, supporting comments to our sub-regional chair, uh, Council Member uh, Director Dyack, I should say, um, just because I, I think our only really re regret from the process is I, I think we wish we would have asked for more for the Lone Tree Mobility Hub because we were a little surprised how well it scored. Uh, at the same token, um, having gone through you know, John, how many of these have we been through? How many tips? And uh, once again, I think, uh, well, Doug, uh, good job taking us through a process that used to be very, very contentious, uh, very rough uh, to something where, Mr. Chair, several years ago, your predecessor. You have to remind me of that. <laughs> your predecessor would not have had to uh, ask for comments twice. There have been many, many comments. So no, once again, I think a, a great example of um, our sub-regional approach 
and how it just seems to um, work out pretty well. I will say, though, to add a uh, negative note to my comments, uh, if you look at some of the comments that came through, particularly, and, and no means to pick on you, Director Mulvey, but the comments that were made for the Castle Pines project, if you read those caref carefully, I, I think everyone, I would ask everyone to please appreciate and respect the fact that we have residents in Douglas County who um, do wish us to make additional investments in the road. Uh, the roadways. There are desires to see roadway improvements, despite uh, the rules we were given for this funding stream. Um, and so uh, please look at those comments. Please respect them as being honest comments from the people of Douglas County and possibly uh, Castle Pines. Thank you, Director. And, and you're right that this was a limited, uh, had limited limitations on it. Uh, the air quality and multimodal funding sort of dictates where the funding has to go. And no loan tree, you don't get a do-over. <laughs> you, you don't get to ask for more. Uh, other comments, questions, please. Director Shaw. Thank you. Um, I, I would like to thank the people who participated in the scoring process. It was tremendously time-consuming and staff for, for putting this all together. I think, Ron, you mentioned how complex this process is to do the calls one, two, three, four for various different types of money, colors of money. And so I'm, I think it is worth the effort, and I would move to allocate $40 million 40.323 million of air quality and multimodal funds to six projects as presented to be included in the current fiscal year 22 to 25 tip. Thank you, uh, Director, for the motion. Uh, do we have a second? Director Williams seconded. Uh, I think they, I, to add on to Director Teal's comments, uh, the fact that we could only allocate the 40 million, but we had uh, Mr. Papstorff, how much uh, were the total? 100 and a little over $103 million in total requests. Uh, it doesn't reflect on the other projects so much uh, negatively as we just didn't have enough peanut butter to, uh, to spread. So uh, uh, a lot of those projects, had we had more funding to allocate, probably would have gone in, except for the Lone Tree Mobility Hub. You should have asked for more in the beginning. Uh, Director Dyack. Yeah, no, and I mean, just to be just to be fair too, um, a, a number of projects that, that scored very well um, took took less money, so we can bring other projects in. Um, that's a, that's been a hallmark, I think, of of, of this dual model approach, is uh, is scoring uh, to uh, Director Papstorf's um, comments. Uh, it's scoring to kind of see where we're at, um, and then going about it and having discussion to try to see how we can get maximum impact across the region in addition to to honoring those those good projects if you will at the top end um, again i think everybody around the table um, within uh, within our technical staff um, really understands that we're trying to um, make all the sub regions um, feel feel valued and have th and that have good projects also have the funding to move forward. So um, again, um, you know, Lone Tree didn't get uh, more money, but um, again, um, you know, uh, Boulder and Denver did not as well. So I'm just trying to be respective. And, and the reason is uh, because we were trying to, to bring uh, Arapaho and Boulder and correct me, I'm, I'm just, I'm reading the tea leaves here, Ron. So I'm not trying to, I'm not trying to in, interpret, but to me um, getting, getting most, if not all, of the sub-regions who submitted um, into, um, into the, the game, so to speak, and have funding, I think is very important. Thank you, Director. Any other comments before we hold a vote? Any other questions? Mr. Chair, I'm not sure there was a second. Sure. Director Cameron. There, there was a second, but I had a question. Um, okay. I, this is the first time I've seen this, so I don't know. Are these scores representative? Uh, is this the first time we've done this process or, okay. So we don't know how 
like these scores are going to compare to other chip applications. Are they really good? Are they just like average, but we picked among the average, you know, I'm just sort of trying to get a sense of how awesome these were or not. Thank you. Mr. Papstorf, can you answer that? Yes, Mr. Chair. Director Cameron, thank you. Thank you for the question. I apologize for sort of skimming over some of the background on this for some of the newer members of the board. Um, so we go through it. We go through a process of developing a transportation improvement program and allocating federal and state transportation funds that flow through Dr. Cog as an agency every four years. We do this full kind of process of calls for projects and the board sets the eligibility and the evaluation criteria, the goals for the TIP process for selecting projects and the overall process. So that's, that's what happened last year to set up this particular process. But, we've, but we develop a TIP every, every four years to allocate uh, federal and state transportation uh, funds through Dr. Cog. Um, and I will say that there were really, really good projects submitted in this, in this cycle. And our scoring criteria set in that, in that TIP policy um, evaluating things like projects impacts on um, equity and air quality and greenhouse gas emissions, all of the goals that you all have set for the region in terms of what we want to achieve from a transportation and other perspectives around the region. So all of those criteria are set ahead of time and then we score the applications against them. But my judgment is we had a, we had a crop of really, really outstanding uh, project submittals here and, and more than we could afford to fund through this, this cycle. Thank you. We should get some jelly to go with the peanut butter. Maybe that would help. <laughs> Any other questions, comments, discussion? If not, I'll call for the vote. Uh, all in favor of the motion on the floor to uh, allocate the $40.323 million uh, to these projects as outlined, please say aye. 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 Anybody who is opposed to this, please say no. Any abstentions, please say abstain. Hearing none, uh, motion passes unanimously. Thank you, Ron. I especially want to thank the uh, project review people, the folks from each subregion who did the scoring, uh, not to uh, single out anyone in particular, but I will, uh, Justin Begley from Denver that I work very closely with is in the back of the room and was here to answer any questions if they occurred. Thank you, Justin, and uh, by extension to the rest of those folks on staff who did all this review work. Uh, very good job and very clearly spelled out for everyone. Thank you, Mr. Thank you. Our next item is, uh, we're on to informational items. Uh, Rich, Rich Morrow, you're up for the legislative wrap up. Thank God, Scene AD, <laughs> right? Ch the children can come out of hiding now, <laughs> as they say. Here. All right. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Am I talk Am I on the mic? Okay. Um, good evening, everyone. I'm just going to take a few minutes uh, to give a, a outline, a summary of the legislative session that thankfully just ended a week ago. Um, and we have our uh, lobbyists, Jen Castle and Ed Bowditch, at the other end of the room. That I'll ask to say just a couple of comments, and then see if anybody else has any questions or. Uh, about anything else. So first of all, I, I just remind you that um, we take positions here, Dr. Cog, on legislation or the staff presents these legislation to you for positions uh, based on uh, our assessment of a, of a potential effect of a bill uh, either on Dr. Cog, uh, its programs, the populations we serve, or the region in particular, that's usually what we use as a screen. Um, we, uh, we looked at, I mean, we actually look at uh, really every bill, at least at the title of every bill first, uh, and then with the lobbyists, what, well over 100 bills that, that we look at in a little more uh, in depth, uh, and then try to pone it down to those ones that we bring to you. This year, uh, you ended up taking positions on 15 bills. Um, we have them summarized uh, in a matrix in your packet, and um, uh, there's a narrative that highlights a, a few others. I'm going to mention two real quick and then have, uh, in the aging world, and then have Ed and Jen mention a, a handful uh, in transportation. 
I wanted to highlight especially House Bill 1035 and Senate Bill 185, uh, they're sort of companion bills uh, that um, I connect to uh, the um, um, sunsetting of the Strategic Action Planning Group on Aging, which we call SAPCA, uh, which was a, a group that uh, Dr. Cog uh, helped create in legislation uh, back in 2017, no, maybe 2015, 2015, and it's sunsetting now, uh, and it did a lot of work um, in terms of uh, highlighting issues in aging and investments needed in aging. It's sunsetting. Uh, 1035, essentially, I would say, uh, transfers SAPCA's role and mission to the st state uh, unit on aging, the state office on aging, uh, remakes the Colorado Commission on Aging somewhat in the image of the membership that SAPCA had. Um, and so we hope that the state, th through implementing this bill can become an even better partner than it's been in the past with the area agencies on aging like Dr. Cog and working on aging issues, as we all know, uh, have become even more and more important these days. Um, uh, Senate Bill 185 um, creates or actually extends a bill from last year that was uh, created an area agency on aging grant fund where we um, that received $15 million in state funds that then was granted out to AAAs like Dr. Cog over the past year. Uh, that bill extends that fund and renames it the Strategic Investments on Aging um, and will be a repository for funds that then can continue to be granted out for programs, uh, pilot projects, infrastructure investments, et cetera. Uh, and so we're going to be um, extra busy, I think, in the coming years working with the state to, to help implement those, those two bills. Uh, and with that, I'll turn over to Ed and Jen to uh, mention a couple of the transportation bills, particularly ones that, that you asked us to get uh, amendments to during the session. Right, thank you, Rich. Good evening, everyone. Jennifer Castle. Um, so two bills specifically that I wanted to give a little bit more detail on as it relates to transportation. Um, the first bill was House Bill 1026. This was a bill that came from the Tax Oversight Interim Committee and that essentially changed a tax deduction into a tax credit for an employer providing alternative transportation options to an employee. Um, based on your feedback, which was wonderful, we approached the sponsors of that bill and expanded what those alternative transportation options could in fact be. Um, that would include ride sharing, van sharing, bike sharing, um, even a scooter sharing program. And I'm still determined to get Ed on a scooter this summer. We'll see if it happens. <laughs> um, the other, the other part of that bill, um, so, but we were successful in, in, in doing that, so thank you all very much for your comments. I think that it definitely made that bill more strong. Um, what also happened on that bill as well, too, is that later on in the legislative session, there was a group that wanted to run an amendment to um, require data sharing. Um, that amendment would have, would have um, conflicted with some of our um, regulations with our way to go program. So we were successful in um, defeating that amendment attempt, attempt. Interestingly enough, this bill was introduced on the first day of the legislative session and it passed on the very last day of the legislative session. So this one had a long journey. <laughs> and the second bill I wanted to mention, just to give a quick overview on this one was House Bill 1138. This was a bill aimed at trying to reduce um, single occupancy vehicle rides. And similar to the to 1026, this bill was offering a tax credit to employers to develop clean commuting plans, clean commuting survey. It did require that though of employers over 100 employees. The one part in that bill that sparked interest in Dr. Cog was that it allowed coordination of NPOs in creating those plans and creating uh, those surveys. And it did also allocate certain funding to those MPOs, um, $250,000 per MPO. Because um, of some, your suggestions, staff suggestions, we had the idea of instead of allocating $250,000 to every um, MPO in the state, rather have it proportionally fit based on employer or based on population, something a little bit more equal um, to, you know, specific to an MPO. Um, we did talk to the sponsor about that. He was supportive of it. Rich testified to that in committee. Um, however, 
the bill did die in its first committee hearing essentially because of that requirement um, that was in the bill. Um, folks did not like that, and so the, the bill did not make it out of its first committee. Good evening, everybody. Ed Bowditch, and again, it's great to see everybody in person. It's been a long few years, and hopefully we can continue to meet in person. Um, think back to the January Zoom meeting. I think it was January when we had a discussion on House Bill 1028, the Uniform Standards for Bicycle Stops, um, called the Idaho Stop Bill. We had quite the debate on that bill. Dr. Cog ended up supporting the bill, but also wanted two amendments, one that would establish a minimum age and one that would establish a, a required education campaign, an education component to the bill. Um, both of those amendments, we were able to get those on the bill and the bill passed. Um, Director Stoltzman came down and testified probably in late January, seems like a long time ago. Um, and again, when we talked with her the day of the event, we said, count the number of jurisdictions you go through coming from Louisville down to the Capitol, and that became part of her testimony that day. Um, so we appreciated the, the clear guidance from the Dr. Cog board on that one. A couple of other things before we, we give it back to, to Jennifer and then Rich. Um, on the budget this year, the state general fund revenues are very strong. So strong, in fact, we have a $2 billion Tabor refund. So you can all expect Tabor refund, uh, refunds this year. Um, one of the other things that they prioritized this year was a large investment in air quality staff and programming at the Department of Public Health. Um, that was a major component of the budget. It was a significant increase for CDPHD on the monitoring an electric lawn equipment rebate program, and more money for the stationary cash fund. So we, we can expect more out of uh, CDPHE on that. A couple of items coming up this fall on the ballot. We love to vote in this state. Right now, there is an income tax reduction that is certified for the ballot. So we pay the flat tax here in Colorado. It was 4.63%. Then it got moved to 4.55% through a ballot measure two years ago this would move it to 4.41%. So a slight reduction. Now when we're in a situation where we have Tabor refunds, that won't impact much. It'll just decrease the refund, but we won't always have Tabor refunds. Um, so that is on the ballot. Other things are approved for circulation, uh, petitions, abortion, mushrooms, money for education, campaign <laughs> finance, and dentistry. Um, so as you wander around the state, you may come up to somebody who has 15 clipboards and wanting you to sign various things. Um, with that, I will give it back to Jennifer. Thank you. Um, also, th this November, just a little bit of a reminder, um, every seat in the state House of Representatives is going to be up for election, as well as about a third of the Senate. Keep an eye on the Senate. That is the one chamber that is likely to maybe flip party control. There were some rumors that the House might be a little bit in jeopardy, but I'm Kind of word on the street is that, is that the Senate is the chamber to watch. Currently, there's a five-vote majority that the Democrats have in the, um, in the Senate. Um, because of retirement, term limits, redistricting, we're going to see anywhere from 20 to 30 new legislators, which is typical every two years. Certainly, per, um, you know, poses a challenge, but it also poses um, an opportunity as well, too. Rich, we'll send it back to you. All right, thank you guys. Um, I'll, just, I'll just wrap up by saying if you look closely at your matrix, you might notice that uh, the status column, um, on some of them, it still has the bill somewhere in the process, and that was because um, the, your board packets went out, and this happens every single year, the board packets went out the same day that the session was ending, last Wednesday, and so several of the bills didn't actually pass or actually a couple of them uh, ended up failing uh, until later that night on Wednesday. So when we do, uh, when, we, when we post it up on, our, on the web and, and then when we send out the board report, we'll have all of that updated as to their final petitions. So I just wanted to make that note. And thank you. Thank you, Rich. Do anybody have any questions for Rich or any discussion? Uh, the session's over, so we can't this discussion won't lead anywhere. Uh, Director Rex. No, I, I was just going to mention that um, that at your seat, 
uh, oh, yes, Ed, yes. Ed and Jen provided their their annual uh, summary of the of the session. So we squeezed in some extra seats. I know. So in case you don't have one, please raise your hand. We do have some extras. Thank you, uh, Dr. Cockrell. Ah, she's asking for a yeah. copy. Thank you. I guess the only comment I would add to that to, to wrap up the legislature legislative season. Uh, thank you, Ed and Jen. Uh, Governor Paulus was down in my council district in southwest Denver today to sign a bill providing for an increase in uh, inpatient uh, mental health treatment beds at the wonderful institution in my district, the Colorado Mental Health Institute at Fort Logan, and also provides for 125 mental health treatment beds statewide in residential facilities. And the only thing I would add to that is that's a drop in the bucket compared to the need. So um, thank you, Rich, for your report. You. Our next item is Regional Shared Micromobility Program and Data Collaborative. Emily Lindsay, come on down. We saw this uh, earlier, and uh, there's very, some very interesting data you're about to see. Good evening, everybody. Nice to see some familiar faces, some new faces, some scooter enthusiasts. I see you over there. Um, all right, I'm Emily Lindsay. I'm in our Transportation Planning and Operations Division. I work on active and emerging mobility programs. Um, I'm here today to talk to you all about shared micromobility in the Denver region. Um, and so I'm sure this is no surprise to you all, but uh, there was a lot happening in 2017, 2018 uh, in the region. We saw the launch of Dockless Bike Share in Aurora. E-scooters hit the streets in Denver. Um, and after all of that kind of happened, we thought we really need to get folks together so that we can <laughs> make some joint decisions and really work together on these emerging mobility options so that we're not reinventing the wheel um, across the region. And so early on in this kind of emergence of e-scooters, e-bikes, shared devices, Dr. Cog joined two national mobility data conversations, uh, the Open Mobility Foundation. There are several members, um, local agencies from the region that are also members in the SAE's Mobility Data Collaborative. This really helped us kind of get a broader picture of what was happening nationally um, and really helped us figure out and contextualize what we could do in the Denver region. Dr. Cog has also been participating in Colorado Electric Vehicle Coalition's micromobility subgroup. Uh, this was founded after Dr. Cog's micromobility subgroup, um, and we lead the shared mobility, micromobility committee. Uh, we helped the state develop the first inventory of shared micromobility programs across the state, um, and we worked with our awesome information systems team to develop a story map to share that information with the public. This is a great resource for local agencies, people that are just interested, um, and decision makers, because you can actually see what your neighbors are up to, what kind of programs exist um, in your neck of the woods, and you can get access to um, links about policy documents, enabling regulations, all of that good stuff um, in one place throughout the state. We also worked with partners through the micromobility work group in the Denver region to develop a document that kind of outlines different um, approaches and regulatory environments for shared micromobility. We have always had uh, bike share in the region for over a decade, um, and it really just evolved. We've had bike libraries, and now we have obviously dockless mobility devices. Uh, but we really wanted to work together to identify opportunities to collaborate um, and to learn from each other. I think we learned early on that if Denver and Aurora are developing policy outcomes as neighbors, we want to make sure that we're sharing knowledge um, and really getting together a coalition of folks that can advise the region on the best way forward. And I think one of the things that really was highlighted as an, an out, important outcome for the region was a consistent and regional approach to data collection. This is something that um, when some of these shared devices came online, they all have GPS sensors 
um, and they can actually push out a feed that shares uh, things like their location, the routes that they take. Um, and instead of uh, asking individual agencies to develop um, staff capacity, purchase tools, we thought, why don't we just do this together? <laughs> we have the need across the region um, and it, it, we can really learn from each other. So currently right now we have five different local cities. Denver, of course, is the first, Aurora, Littleton, Arvada, and Boulder, along with Dr. Cog, CDOT, and RTD. Um, this is kind of a, a different model than is typically approached uh, in the nation. So we've received a lot of interest from our peer MPOs about this process. Um, and just a little bit more about how they might be able to do stuff in their region. So we get a little bit of, of uh, interest both from both inside our own region and outside across the nation. So we have developed a local policy, data policy template that folks that are bringing new programs online can use. We're always happy to, to help out, <laughs> take a look at different data elements of uh, agreements with operators. Um, and then, like I mentioned, we have that shared micromobility work group. So we can actually connect folks in the region that are operating these programs. So it's not just Dr. Cog providing that expertise, but it's really the coalition of staff from your member government agencies. So just to give you guys an idea of what we're talking about here, um, through March 2022, so pretty recently, uh, the region's seen almost 8 million total trips on these shared devices almost 10 million miles traveled. Um, these trips are pretty short, eight minutes, well, a little less than a mile. Um, and you can aggregate that even further if you're interested. Uh, just to give you an idea of the total trips that are, have happened in the region, again, programs have kind of come online since the beginning of this. So this is a cumulative metric. Uh, you can see 2019 on the left, and then towards the right, we're into 2022. Uh, but we're well above our kind of initial 2019 numbers. Then you can see kind of a, a little little dip there uh, during March, April of 2020. Summer was back, um, and then 2021 was a very hot year. I'm anticipating another hot summer for micromobility. So um, you can check that out um, publicly, and I'll, I'll tell you a little bit more about that in a minute. But I really want to emphasize that this wouldn't be possible without partnership. I think this, is, again, is a really unique agreement that we have in the region. This is not something that is happening across the country. This really took forethought um, of our local agencies to come together to think about the policies and agreements they're signing with operators. They're requesting the right data. They're saying we want to share it with our partners and third-party platforms. Um, and they're also saying, we want to share some of this information publicly. And so outlining all of these things is, is a very proactive step, as I'm sure some folks in this room know. Uh, it's something that you really have to think about ahead of signing those agreements and adopting those ordinances. So this really wouldn't be possible without local agency partnerships. And so recently, we launched an open data portal for the region. This is the first of its kind nationwide. Um, aggregating kind of all of these metrics across the different programs that are live. This is just a screenshot, but you can use this QR code or it's available, a link is available on our website to check out really the different statistics from each of the agencies that have programs, or you can get that kind of top line number about what's going on in the region. And just to give you a little preview of um, what that looks like if you click on one of the local agencies, you can really see a variety of metrics um, that are specific to that jurisdiction. So it's not all just the regional data picture. Uh, you also get into, this is an example from Littleton. You can click on a street segment. You can see the number of trips that went through that segment um, in addition to that kind of percentage uh, of all trips. So you can really get an idea of where folks are traveling um, if there's bike facilities on that roadway or street segment, if there's multi-use paths nearby. So really it can be used as a tool um, both internally and externally to better understand shared micromobility and the overall transportation system. And I just wanted to do one more example. This is from Denver. Um, you might recognize this down here. But again, you really get that, that other perspective of what's happening 
um, in the different land use contexts throughout the region. So as you can see, the metrics at the bottom, those will change depending on what you're looking at, but you really get access to the same data apples to apples across the region, which is pretty cool. So with that, I'm happy to take questions, chat more, um, but mostly thank you and the local agencies for participating in this project. Thank you, Emily. That's uh, some incredible numbers there. Uh, any questions, comments, discussion? Uh, Director Williams. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And just want to say thank you to Dr. Cog and Emily of all the hard work uh, that she's done. I mean, this has obviously been a, you know, uh, probably not deservedly, but a high profile program uh, on there and, and being able to interact with our, our peers here. Uh, and then really the, the ride report was a huge game changer for us. Tremendous contractor had, I was telling Emily, I had coffee with them this morning uh, on that. And, and really it is, you know, it, it, scooters are, you know, not just a cool way to break your arm. They are a, uh, uh, you know, there's a lot of kind of what you showed there, the, the, where, where they're being ridden. Um, you know, there's a, a, a big opportunity for that data and just what a rich data source these vehicles are. And you can see that popularity. I mean, 8,000 people per day, this is arterial levels of, of movement are taking uh, scooters and bikes on there. So just wanted to say again, thank you. Thank you to Emily and Dr. Cog and really appreciate the effort on this. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Director Spear. Thank you. I just wanted to echo the thanks. Um, we have found it incredibly valuable to have access to all of this data and information, have it right at our fingertips, ready to share out with our community. So it's been a huge benefit. We're really grateful to Dr. Cog for the support. Thank you. Uh, Director Smith? Yes, I just had a question. If we are able to find a way to capture the conversion of people, um, the, the conversion of people from maybe they were already using vehicles and then using scooters versus are these people that are using the scooters already planning on walking that and now there's a scooter? Is there a way to capture that data of conversion? Yeah, that's a great question. I'll let Director Williams um, weigh in if I can mess this up here. But so far, this data that we gather is, is from the vehicle feed, so there's not a lot of information about the user. Part of that is just to protect personal privacy. But we do have some access to survey information, like the city and county of Denver has surveyed riders about their trip replacement and what mode they would have taken. Again, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe it hovers around 30% of trips are replacing single occupancy vehicle or drive trip. Thank you. Any other questions? Uh, Director Conklin. Yeah, just a comment. And this is great. The information's great. I, I think at some point we're going to have to Look at how do we weigh in on the safety function that isn't the scooters. Uh, driving here tonight, I drove past 23 scooters. Uh, 21 of them were blocking right-of-ways. They were blocking handicap ramps. They were blocking sidewalks. Two, only two were not blocking a sidewalk or a part of a sidewalk. Um, this is, it, it, these are wonderful. But as we try to have mobility, we try to have walkability, we try to have safety for the pedestrians, at some point we're going to have to, to use this data in some way or create new data that, that lets us kind of weigh in and look at, at, at that wrestling match between uh, you know, maybe taking vehicles off the road, but what it's also doing to our, our walkability in many of our cities. Thank you, Director. Um, maybe I'll put my colleague from Denver on the spot and asked uh, Director Williams what, because uh, I was going to make the same observation, thank you, uh, Steve, that uh, on my travels I see that scooters look like they are deposited uh, in the morning by the vendors, by the, the people who charge them, and they're deposited right on the ADA ramps uh, so that someone in a wheelchair couldn't possibly cross from sidewalk to sidewalk. And what can, what can is Denver looking at this? Are we looking at this and how to handle it? Yeah, you know, and this has obviously been a, a challenge since these started. I think it's it's beginning to improve. You know, we always said that no one rode scooters before these. It wasn't like bikes where we've all ridden bikes for our whole life. So it really it's a it's a mixture of as you develop these agreements with the the companies, making sure that you have some enforcement measures, and also their challenge is making sure you have staff and the resources to actually do that enforcement. Uh, Ride Report has been a great service for that kind of enforcement aspect of it. Um, but we are shifting our uh, right-of-way enforcement uh, officers 
um, to start making more observations with then uh, disincentives within the in our license agreements with each of them. But it's it's a lot of work still to be done. Um, you're starting to see more. The, the GPS on these vehicles is getting more precise. You know, I think everyone kind of wants, well, it would be great if we could just get them to GPS off of the sidewalks. We're not there yet, especially in a downtown with tall buildings on there. It, it kind of takes really all of the above on that. And I think that's why it's been so good to have this collaborative experience with, with Dr. Cog that, you know, I have ideas and our, our staff has ideas, but hearing from the other communities and agencies has been really helpful. But a lot of work still to be done, definitely. Thank you, Director. Other comments or questions on this item? Seeing none, uh, we can move on to our next item, which is informational items. We have two of them, uh, which I believe you can uh, peruse at your leisure. And uh, administrative modifications to the 2225 TIP and Denver Regional Data Brief by uh, Andy Taylor. Uh, next item is committee reports. First up is report from the stack, and uh, who's going to give that? <laughs> yeah, sorry, I totally forgot. Um, yeah, uh, Director Maurer couldn't be with us this evening, so she provided a summary of the meeting. Uh, let me get to it here real quick. All right, so um, the only action item from, from the meeting was a change in the meeting date. Um, it was changed to the first Thursday of the month. Um, uh, and the meetings are most of them will be will be virtual. Two meetings per year, May and October, will be in person. Um, so the, the the reason for the change in the day was uh, CD, CDOT needed more time to prepare for the stack meeting and the TC meeting that followed the following week. There was there's always been an issue with preparing the the uh, the agenda um, in time after the TC meeting. So they, they moved the date a little bit. Now this affects uh, director Maurer's ability to, uh, to attend that meeting. Um, and you'll be hearing more about that in, 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 uh, in later meetings as we uh, look for a way to, to, uh, to get to where we need to be and make sure we have representation. But I know director Williams is going to assist with that. So, so thank you, sir. Um, see, there was a conversation about bus thing expansion. Um, they are planning additional uh, mobility hubs in northern uh, Colorado in the north, in northern I-25 corridor. Um, there's um, been enhanced rider. They, they believe there are enhanced ridership opportunities on I-70 and I-25. They are uh, talking to uh, the Wisconsin DOT about the possibility of extending service to the north into uh, Cheyenne, uh, to Cheyenne. Um, and uh, this, the expansion as far as funding uh, uh, Funding sources, they're they're looking at using future mo, uh, multimodal mitigation options fund, as well as possibly some CMAC money so they receive to to uh, to use to expand their service. There's also a conversation about the greenhouse gas um, rule, and they're in the process right now of drafting a policy directive, which will go to the commission later this week. Um, that basically lists uh, uh, greenhouse gas uh, mitigation measures. Uh, and scoring and the calculation of how that's all done. And you'll be hearing a lot more about that, uh, most notably at our June 1st board work session. I'm sure we'll be talking about that some more. Last but not least, um, they received presentations from uh, the five enterprises that are, that are now in place, some of those as a result of 260, um, the Non-Attainment Area Air Pollution Mitigation Enterprise, Director Baca. Uh, clean Transit Enterprise, Clean Fleet Trend Enterprise, Community Access Enterprise, and last but not least, Statewide Bridge and Tunnel Enterprise. That's that's my report, or Director Maurer's report. Thank you, uh, Director Rex. Uh, the next up is report from the Metro Mayor's Caucus. Uh, Mayor Starker is not here, but he has sent a report in, and that report is that there has not been a Metro Mayor's Caucus meeting since... <laughs> That's not funny. <laughs> <laughs> there has not been a Metro Mayor's Caucus meeting since our last Dr. Cog board meeting, so we have no report tonight. Thank you. Uh, next up is Metro Area County Commissioners, Director Baker. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, we'll be meeting here in this room on Friday, the 20th at 9.30 in the morning. Our agenda, we will have three of our MAC members presenting on their homelessness um, efforts. 
That will be Adams County, uh, Denver, and Douglas County. We're also going to be hearing a proposal from Douglas County about aerial wildfire prevention. So, uh, again, if anyone is interested in attending that and want more information, please click email. With that information, that concludes my report. Thank you, Director Baker. Uh, I'm going to skip over Committee on Aging and uh, go to Regional Air Quality Council, Executive Director Rex. And tonight. Okay, so we met on May 6th. Um, the, uh, the RAC, they, they updated their employee handbook to include a pandemic policy as well as a college reimbursement policy, which was approved by, by the board. Um, they kicked off their uh, summer ozone um, public awareness campaign, Civil Steps Better, Better Air. Uh, so we got a presentation from staff on that. And of course, as, as I always report, we received another um, a presentation on draft elements of the, of the state impl implementation plan, which will, will go to the legislature next session for approval. Um, legislative update, uh, the carbon monoxide maintenance uh, achievement. Uh, we're now in attainment for carbon monoxide after 20 years of a maintenance area, and you received that presentation last month. And that was about it. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, a report from E-470 Authority, Director Mulvey. Yes, thank you. Uh, we met last week. The, for our, the primary activity was to review the annual audit with no uh, major issues. There was also some standard contracts for firewall and security on the IT basis and also bridge and asphalt contracts. Aside from that, it was really mostly a pro forma meeting. Thank you. Uh, we're going to go back to Advisory Committee on Aging. Uh, in JLA's absence, Executive Director Rex will give that report. Thank you, sir, very much. On April 15th, the Advisory Committee on Aging met. They have one action item. It was approval of Senate Bill 290 funding. We funded, uh, the, well, the state uh, funded three projects in this region, and that was later approved uh, by the Finance and Budget Committee, uh, I guess, last month on, on that. Three briefings. One was a new uh, rebranding of of, uh, of the AAA, um, new logo, and all that kind of good stuff. And I'm sure, Steve, we should provide that information to the board at some point. That'd be great. Thank you, sir. Legislative update from Rich Morrow. And uh, he, uh, quite frankly, I think Rich looks pretty damn good right now. I mean, he I, he looks a lot better than he has in, in past legislative sessions, Rich. I don't know, but you look pretty good. <laughs> and last but not least, they're they're working on some changes to their committee guidelines, which will come to will come to the board at some later date. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, last two items: reports from CDOT and RTD on fast tracks. Uh, the directors from CDOT and RTD are not here tonight, so we won't have those reports. That takes us to administrative items. Our next meeting is June 15, 2022, in this room. Uh, in between, we will have the board workshop, which will be online, uh, but this meeting will be in person. And uh, are there other matters by members? It seems there are none. In that case, we have no other business here, so we are adjourned. Do I have to do this? We're adjourned. This is a parking thing. Hey, everybody. Is this on? Okay. Everyone, if you need parking, if you need parking validation, attention, everybody. If you parked in the garage, we have validations up here. Validations for the parking garage. All right.